the end to you. We are very blessed. Of course, thankfulness is a condition of the heart. And some people are thankful for everything. And some people are thankful for nothing. And it's a total choice. Total choice. Total choice. Total choice. And we choose happy. We choose thankfulness. So it is a good thing to practice thanksgiving. It is a, a Christian practice that's all but forgotten, especially in our, our, our materialistic, narcissistic society. We have been conditioned to think it's all about us and our perfectionism rather than saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? And Lord, thank you for even saving me. Lord, thank you for even letting me live in the United States where I have the convenience of everything accessible at a fingertip. My biggest problem is that the pickup groceries weren't ready on time and the traffic light was backed up five cars longer than it usually is because all the Yankees are moving to escape their democratic cesspools. That just means how blessed you have been all along and didn't realize it. And we have to tell people from time to time, you're getting to live somebody else's dream and we bellyache about it. You live someone's dream. You're convinced it's a nightmare. And what that is, is petty existence. So we got to practice thankfulness the old psalm says, uh, the old song, count your blessings one by one. Count them. Be blessed. You have two legs. You're still breathing. You still have voice. You still have the ability to declare things. You still have people that love you. You still have a church that lets you attend because you're not doing us a favor by being here. We're doing you a favor by letting you come. You have access to money. You have access to the Walmarts and like three of them within driving distance very quickly. And you got like nine Starbucks in this town and then a hundred other coffee bars too, should you want coffee. And if you want tea, there's sweet tea and the diabetes too that goes with it. You, you are blessed. <laughs> so I don't really know why we got, we've gotten into this hurtful habit of just complaining, complaining, complaining. You can ruin a paradise through complaining. Or you can turn a hell hole into a paradise by thanksgiving. It's totally in the eye of the beholder and in the confession of the mouth. So we ought to, as a congregation, just as believers, practice thanksgiving a lot more and be thankful for salvation every morning, be thankful to have the Holy Ghost, to have the ability to pray in tongues, have access to a Bible, and you're not going to go to jail because you got caught with one. You ought to be thankful that you have money in your pocket, that most of us have a little bit of flub hanging off the side that we wish we could get rid of. So obviously food is not an issue. I don't know what we're complaining about. Most of our messes we made. And you don't complain about yourself. You complain about everything but yourself. So really in our age, it's not even the devil that's the problem. It's us. And we could resolve so much of that by being thankful and making our house, our apartment, our condo a place of thanksgiving. And if, if God was fe if he felt welcomed and thanked, he might show up a lot more. A lot more. And if God showed up a lot more than all those other problems we thought we might have might just resolve themselves through his presence. And I've taught you that sometimes just spending time in God's presence will dissolve problems and you realize they weren't really the problem. It was just your perspective on the problem. So we really need to focus on thanksgiving and fixing our heart. So Jeremiah 17, let's talk about the heart. I hadn't taught on this in a while, but being in worship and being in the presence of God, uh, you pick up on things and sometimes you can adjust your sermon on the fly if you even had one to begin with. I'm not saying whether I did or I didn't tonight, but Jeremiah 17 is a good place to start. We hadn't looked at this publicly in New Living Translation. That's kind of my new favorite go-to. Uh, I need to buy one. I, don't act, I have a little bitty one, but I need actually a big study NLT. And I, now I'm even having trouble finding verses in the King James because I'm learning them in the NLT. And that just really messes up my word searches. And they're on the wrong page. And anyway, first world problems. I will yet be thankful that I have access to all these Bibles at my fingertips. Jeremiah 17, this passage should be very familiar to all of you. We have new folks that have not been here uh, since we started teaching on the heart back in 2008. And I think that teaching on what the heart is was probably one of the more transformative things we've ever done or taught. What the big picture is, once we understand what the heart is and how it works, we become totally responsible for everything. And we also can completely change anything. If we understand that our heart is the summation of what we think and emote 
and want. And if we learn and understand that we can change what we think and we can change what we emote and we can change what we want, then we can change our heart. And if we can do all that, then we can program our heart and by default program our faith. That also means whatever's in you right now that doesn't glorify God, you have the ability to take out and remove like you're deprogramming a system if you want to. Now, not everybody wants to. The, what we do when we preach is we motivate people to want to be different, to think different, to say in their heart, bless God, I used to be that way. I ain't going to be that way now. Preaching, in a sense, teaches people how to reprogram their heart. But you studying your Bible, you being discipled, this also teaches you how to think, how to emote, how to want. Parenting is all about doing all three for your children. In our household with our girls, we, we have a phrase we use. We said, let's work on our emotions. Having two girls, you have to work on emotions. And even Justice now, he's a boy, he has emotions. His aren't like the girls. His, his, when he gets frustrated, it comes out as little boy rage. He, he gets mad. And boy, let's work on those emotions. Because if I don't teach him how to handle those emotions, he becomes someone I'll visit in the jail in the future. The reason my children have a father is so that I can teach them how to handle their emotions. Now, let me say something very racist. Okay? I watch a lot of cricket. That's not racist. Really? This is new. I know. Trust me, if you stay on TikTok, you'll learn what's racist in five minutes because it's always evolving. And when everything's racist, nothing is. So I watch a lot of cricket, which is a British sport. I watch IPL. We're in IPL season, which means I'm watching five and six cricket matches a week right now. It's mostly Indians, Aussies, Kiwis, South Africans, and some Islanders because it's British Commonwealth. And it's a very competitive sport. The top cricket player makes like three million a year for two months of work. It's, it's a lot of money there. It's just as competitive. And when they do poorly, they don't misbehave, get mad, punch, fight, cuss, or break stuff. When the bowler, that's what they call the pitcher, when the bowler bowls a ball, they get a six, that's a home run. You can see him sometimes, he'll mouth, well done. They, they encourage each other. But that's a different culture at home. Among the Indians, they have mom and dad and they're taught British manners. So watching cricket, as competitive as it is, it's basically their World Series. When they have issues, nobody gets into fights. Nobody gets ejected. And then I think about our sports. How come you're chuckling? Because you know exactly what I'm talking about ejection, brawls, fights, clearing the dugout. It isn't just basketball, it's mostly white baseball, which has a lot of Puerto Ricans and now the Latinos in it. Why, why do our ball players beat the fire out of each other while they're getting paid five million a season? Because they have no home training, no dads at home. My point is when you have parents, your job as a parent is to train your children Let's deal with our emotions. Let's work on them. We teach our children how to think, how to process things. We teach our children what they should and shouldn't want. We teach our children how to work mind and will and emotions because I'm training a heart that I, that I have to have ready absorbed the faith of God. Otherwise, it's going to destroy itself. When you teach your children they're a victim, they're always going to be a victim. When you teach your children they're the victor, they're always going to conquer. And it totally starts at home. Culture begins at home. Failures begin at home. Criminality begins at home. All right, so Jeremiah, we're going to read it. New Living Translation. You ready back there on the overhead jumbotron? I gave you plenty of time. Verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. The heart is more deceitful. That's in ASB. Excuse me. I'm looking at the wrong translation. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. This is why we can't trust our heart. The human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Boy, that lets us know our heart is a work in progress. Uh, NIV says incurably sick. Incurably sick. It means you never get to a place where you can leave it alone. <clears throat> 
We understand this. We can have a good season in our life, and then all of a sudden, we're just in a funk. We're in a thankful season, then we're in a begrudging season. We're in a season of clarity, then we're in a season of fog. It, the fact that the King James or, or the NIV translates the Hebrew as incurably sick means it's going to always need our attention. Just like your human body, it's always needing maintenance, it always needs the next meal, it always needs the next bath, it always needs the next walk, it always needs the next bit of exercise, it has, teeth need the next brushing, facial hair needs the next shaving. It's incurable, it's always needing maintenance and your heart needs regular maintenance. If you take your hand off your heart, if you view it as a garden, it will have weeds before you know it. In fact, the Lord Jesus uses that in the parables of the sower sows the word. Weeds are an issue in the heart. The heart must be tended to regularly. He says in next part, um, verse 10, but I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. God rewards us according to our heart. When your life is what it is, you need to know that's the reward for your heart. Your life is the reward for your heart, according to verse 10. You can do all sorts of good, wonderful works outwardly, but this verse says the Lord sees the heart and he rewards you based on the heart. And give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. So you can do things one way, but the motive behind it being wrong and it counts towards nothing. It's not just the action, it's the heart behind the action. And that's why we have to study the heart to make sure all of our motives are pure. Now, we, I taught on this. This is one of the first big series I tackled as a pastor uh, in 2008. So that's 16 years ago. Actually, this season, about 16 years ago. Because I said you could use your faith to go to hell. And, and somebody said, I, I thought faith was of the heart. I said, it is. And they said, well, I thought the heart was a spirit. I said, it's not. It's totally different. And you can use faith to curse yourself. And people do every day. They believe they receive tongues is not for today. That's a blasphemy. That's a heresy. They believe that they receive God doesn't heal anymore. They believe that they receive everybody's going to heaven. They believe they receive there is no hell. This is faith. It's just bad faith. And it curses people. So bigger picture, if you can somehow track how you're thinking, you can tell where you're going to end up. If you're, if you're living cuckoo, if you're living paranoid, if you're living in a place where you're always thinking everybody's against you or you're always daydreaming about how you're going to do better than somebody else and put them down, if you can somehow track your thought patterns, you can see why your life is going the way it is. And if you can see what sets you off emotionally, you can see that thing that's going to keep you from going anywhere in life. And if you can see what your wants are and why, what is the track record of your wants? And then you ask yourself, do I think the thoughts of Christ? Do I want what God wants? Do I have the emotions that God has every time something happens? You can very quickly begin to see why we maybe haven't advanced like we should have. And again, just because you have a brain that knows stuff doesn't mean that's what you think. I use the example that all of our brains have a lot of understanding on a lot of things. It doesn't mean you dwell on that. What are you dwelling on? It isn't the fact that you have a random weird thought. That's not going to set you off course. It's not the fact that you have maybe wondered, is I wonder if evolution is true. That's not going to set you off course. But whatever you begin to meditate on, whatever you begin to set your mind on, as the Bible uses the term, set your heart on and think on this, it's going to steer you. Your thoughts steer you. Your emotions steer you. Your will steers you. And we have to submit all three to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the Bible. Now, <clears throat> this, we also understand we've all gotten to a place where we had our heart, quote unquote, set on something. And when your heart gets set, that's when things become difficult. When your heart gets set, that's when the Lord comes along and touches things and it becomes very difficult to get rid of. And we feel that. It, it feels like, I call it the death of a dream. It becomes almost something worth fighting over because your heart is set on it. When your heart isn't set on it, you don't care. When your heart isn't set on it, you, you don't care. When we like to use sports teams, if you're wearing a shirt and it's not your team, but you're wearing it and somebody comes along and says, hey, that team stinks, you say, I don't care. I got, it's just a shirt. Somebody gave it to me. This is my workout shirt. But if that's your team and they say that team stinks, you might want to fight because your heart is set on it. 
nobody has a problem when they make fun of somebody else's mama, but if they make fun of your mama, that's why mama jokes are so powerful because your heart is set on that. So we have to regularly evaluate where is our heart set because it ought to be set in Christ. It ought to be set on the things above. It ought to be set on God. You can always tell when God is dealing with you when he asks you to do something and your heart says, I don't want to. Why not? Because you've got something set that he doesn't want set. You can feel it's you're being stretched and your muscles don't want to go that way. But who gave you permission to let your muscles get set that way? This is why we teach you walk into things slowly. We're not in a rush to do anything. We walk in contentment. We get permission from God. We say, Lord, if you would permit me, I'd like to do this. Lord, if you'd permit me, I'd like to do that. That way you don't get your heart set. Now, once the Lord grants you permission, it's okay to get your heart set. And this doesn't mean we hold everything just willy-nilly. You ought to have your heart set on righteousness and have your heart set on your marriage and have your heart set on your children and have your heart set on the word of God and have your heart set on the local church you're called to. There's things you set your heart on, but even then you still keep that thing loose in that what if the Lord has you move from the local church to go fill a missionary position? What if, what if that child has to grow up and move away? You have to be able to let them go. So there is this balance we use the example of it's like holding a baseball bat, or I guess tonight a cricket paddle. You have to hold it tight enough you can hit a home run, but not so tight you break your wrists. And in baseball, you have to hold it so tight you can crack that home run and then sling it down and run. If we hold it too loose, everything the life, life throws at us will knock the, pat, the paddle, the bat out of our hand. If we hold it too tight, everything we hit breaks our hands and our wrists. So there's a, there is this tension there that God graces us to walk out. Look at um, Matthew 15. You guys know a lot of my stories. I don't have any real new ones to tell you. The heart is desperately wicked. It is incurably sick. I guess I got a couple new ones that talk, deal with my heart. The heart is just, our hearts are wonky. Just flat out dumb wonky. Because today they're in love with something and tomorrow they'll betray it. Brother Hagen called that carnal love. That carnal love, natural human love, loves today and hates tomorrow. But the love of God endures. It's like middle school relationships. It's carnal, whimsical. It's like that little 13-year-old had nine boyfriends in the first month of school. And she got two more queued up in case this relationship don't work out. Well, somebody's got home training issues. Somebody's got daddy issues. Um, Matthew 15, verse 16. Actually, verse 15. Then answered Peter and said to him, Declare unto us this parable. He was bold to ask for answers, explanations. And then the Lord, the Lord does not believe in the sentiment that there's no such thing as a dumb question. The Lord Jesus certainly believed they were dumb questions. That was one of them. Because look, look what Jesus says. Are you yet without understanding? How many times are you going to ask a question? Well, that's how Jesus, the lover, <laughs> the nicer than Jesus. When the Lord Jesus looks at you and says, how can you guys be this dumb? I think you think to yourself, I'm not asking any more questions. This Jesus guy is not very cuddly. He does not hug me like my homeschool teacher, which is your mother, by the way, if you didn't know. <laughs> New Living Translation says, don't you understand yet? Verse 17 do not you understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So notice that what, what's in your heart, if it, doesn't, if it isn't resolved, if it isn't dealt with, defiles you. You can live perfect on the outside, but it's what's in your heart that will eventually come out. That is what defiles you. That's why we have to judge our heart. That's why we have to walk with it, cleanse it, purify it, and ask the Lord regularly, show me, Lord, where I'm not thinking right. Show me, Lord, where I'm not reasoning right. Show me, Lord, where I'm not wanting what you want. Show me, Lord, where my, my emotions are wonky. And 
Ask people that you trust, hey, how, how do you think I handled that? How do you think I'm doing here? And the Bible gives us permission to hold each other in check and to hold each other accountable and say, whoa, 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 chill out there. Uh, that, that's crazy thinking. That's crazy talk. Why would you talk that way? Why would you emote that way? Why, would, why, do, you, why do you want that? If you can't be touched by anybody, you're, you're reprobate. We ought to all have access in a loving way to go to our closest people, our closest friends, and say, why do you think that way? Why? Don't talk bad about that. That's not their full, fullness. Why, why do you reason that way? We ought to be able to go to each other and help each other with our hearts because our hearts are the source of our faith. And if everybody's got a sick, contaminated heart, then the total faith of the congregation is sick and contaminated. But also see what comes out of your mouth reveals what's corrupt in you. How you talk to your spouse reveals corruption. How you talk to your boss reveals corruption. How you talk to your equal reveals corruption. How you talk to people less than you in society reveals your corruption. Do you treat everybody with kindness or do you do treat some people, you, you, you just so convinced you're better than them, you treat them like dogs. You have no idea who they are in life. It really is uh, quite amazing how arrogant we can be rather than showing honor to all people. Really, no, the home life reveals best who we are. The home life reveals best who we are because that's when your guard is down. That's when you're free to walk around in your proverbial pajamas your spiritual pajamas, your spouse knows the real you. Your kids know the real you. I find that even in our children's departments, parents get nervous because kids tell all. I notice that in our youth group, parents get nervous because those kids tell all and they know better. And I've seen parents get real defensive and real, real uh, fearful. And I think, what's there to be afraid of? There's a place for discretion. I get it. There's a place where you want family things to be family, but if it wasn't uh, that foul, you wouldn't be that nervous. You know, you, you don't, if you have to tell your kids, please don't go tell the youth group that your father and I fought with irons and pans and, and uh, don't fight with cast iron skillets and you won't have to tell your kids, don't tell your youth group that we fight like this. If you have to get Nerf swords and go beat each other in the backyard and call it medieval marriage therapy or something. My parents love that Nerf marriage therapy. <laughs> yes, my liege. Whack. We can see what's in us, but what's coming out of our mouths. And what we often do is the more you have to speak up to justify something, the more you're probably wrong. The more you have to sell yourself on something, the more you're probably already indicting yourself that the Holy Ghost is on the inside saying, no, no, no. And we've all been there. We've all been there going, nope, nope, no, not that. Not that. Can't be that. Nope, nope. Because this, this, this. And all of a sudden we become a word knowledge guru and we have all these scriptures. We've never had so many scriptures to justify. And if you'd had peace, you wouldn't have to use all those scriptures to justify. The more you have to speak to defend yourself, the more you probably are indicting the fact that you don't have permission. And it isn't, it's wild to think we can take the word of God and further deceive ourselves simply because we won't be still and say, Lord, you're true. Let me be the liar. So this, this teaching, and again, we, we taught on this for two and a half years uh, on Wednesday nights, 2008, 2009, 2010. This concept should pretty, be pretty well instilled here that our heart is a steward. It's a stewardship. We're the steward of it. We can turn this thing any way we want to. We ought to be able to take our heart off of anything and put it where it needs to be. There ought not be a single idol left in our heart once we see it. The second we see an idol, we start tearing that thing down, grinding it into powder, strong upon the water and drinking it. Why do we drink it? So it can go out into the draught, like what Jesus said here in Matthew 15. So let's look at Revelation. Let's see another passage that talks about the heart. And I will read this out of the New Living Translation. So let's throw that up on the screen. Revelation chapter 2. Here the Lord Jesus quotes Jeremiah 17. And it's not a warm, fuzzy passage. I, I hope in your personal Bible studies, they, they're both encouraging and they're revealing the lordship of Jesus to you. And you're realizing Jesus is not as squeezy as the seeker-friendly movement wants him to be. Jesus is not as fuzzy. He's not as accommodating. 
He's the Lord God. He's the captain of the Lord's armies. He's a soon and coming king. He has a vesture dipped in blood. That blood is the blood of his enemies. He's a God of vengeance, a God of wrath. He's a God that hates. We're thankful to be born again. We were his enemies and he died for us. And we're going to see here in Revelation 2 how serious God is. And keep in mind, this is the early church, the church of Thyatira, which means they ought to be swimming in abundant mercy and grace. This is Revelation chapter 2. This is like 60 years after his resurrection. Our church is 40 years old. So this passage is being written 20 years longer than we've been around to a church that John the Revelator is pastoring. John the Revelator, of course, is, when he writes this, he's on the Isle of Patmos. But church history tells us he was the bishop of these churches. He was stationed in Ephesus. That's what he was over. But he's the bishop over the region. This church is under his responsibility. John is called the apostle of love. And what's about to be written is love. It just isn't seeker friendly love. It isn't Osteen love. It isn't Rick Warren love. It's Jesus kind of love. So let's hear how serious this is. So Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, New Living Translation. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. Now, pause there for a second. When you go into the beginning of Revelation chapter 1, you see that John sees him and he sees all these characteristics about him. He sees um, him walking among the seven candlesticks, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt, uh, girt with the paps with a golden bridle. His head and his hair was like white, white like wool, the white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were fi like unto fine brass and burned in a furnace. His voice was as the sound of many waters. He, and he had in his hand seven stars. In each of these seven micro epistles to the seven churches, Jesus uses one to two of those descriptions to describe himself. And then he applies that description to the problem there. And that's a study fascinating in and of itself to see how he can tell the church at Ephesus that I'm the, the one that walketh among the seven golden stand, uh, candlesticks. I'm the one that holds the seven stars in his right hand. Why did he say that to Ephesus and not Smyrna or Pergamos? Because that part of who the Lord is applies to what the church at Ephesus is dealing with. Here, the church at Thyatira is going to get to know about the Son of God whose eyes are like the flames of fire. That's not encouraging. That's not hopeful. That means I look at you and you make me burn. Not with passion. Not with desire. This is the same thing he looks like when he comes back to destroy his enemies. He's looking at this church and it makes his eyes burn with fire. And then his feet are like polished bronze or fine brass burning in a furnace. That means, well, if he wants to stomp on his enemies, church, I got something special for you. Get ready, get ready, get ready. He's revealing a part of his nature looking at this church, and he's about to really wear this church out. I'm glad I don't attend the Thyatira church at all because Jesus doesn't like them. He loves them, but he doesn't like what goes on there. So what goes on there? Verse 19, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Hooray! But we still have a problem. Now, I would love to preach that because it means we should have constant improvement in everything. That's a message the Umper Cumberland needs to hear every service till the Lord comes back. The Lord Jesus needs to be able to look at the believers of the upper Cumberland and be able to say, I see your improvement in all things. And hopefully he can look into your life and say, I see your improvement in your marriage. I see your improvement in your self-control. I see your improvement in your budget. I see your improvement in your love walk. I see your improvement in your prayer life. If he can't say it, then you're less than Thyatira at this moment. Not a good church to be less than. I can see your constant improvement in all these things, but I have this complaint against you. Here's where he doesn't hug anymore. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. So for all the things the church was improving in, they let a woman do what she wanted in a sinful matter. Now, you know, 
If women want to bake something, bake something. That sounds sexist. They want to have a career, let them have a career. That's not the problem. The problem is she, she's a Jezebel. Jesus calls her a Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess. He calls her a Jezebel. She identifies as a prophetess. It really doesn't matter what you identify as. That goes for the whole identifying culture that we have today. All that matters is what God calls you. You're not going to get to judgment day and, he, and say, I identify as a born again one. I identify as saved. I identify as a saint. I identify as holy and righteous. You are what God calls you. And it would be good to get in God's presence and say, Lord, how do you see me? Not how do I fancy myself? Lord, what do you see? How do you see me? What do you call me? And if he calls you servant, praise God. If he calls you child of God, praise God. If he calls you Jezebel, you're in trouble. Jezebel's not a good name to be called. You permit her to lead my servants astray. Number one, you permit her to be a prophetess in your church. That means she acts like she has everything going on. She hears from God. And she teaches my servants. Remember, they call, God says these are mine. She thinks they're hers. So God has a real problem when you start misleading his people, thinking it's all about you. She teaches them to commit sexual sin. That's the seeker-friendly movement. And that's a lot of preachers today saying, you know, it's the hyper-grace movement saying, you've been forgiven. You don't need to confess your sin anymore. That's the doctrine of Balaam. Jesus hates that too. You teach them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. That was a literal thing in their day. If we were to principalize it today, it would mean we're teaching God's people to violate their conscience. You and I could, we've probably eat, eaten food offered to idols. We didn't even know it. Because the idol's nothing and the food's nothing. Paul said, eat it and give thanks for it. Unless they tell you it's eaten from an idol, then don't do it for their conscience sake, not yours because you don't care. But this is a point that he, she, this Jezebel, is teaching God's servants to sear their conscience, to violate what they've been taught in a sinful direction. Anybody that does that is a wicked individual. Anybody that teaches God's people to violate their conscience in a sinful direction is wicked. And here's where we start to see the eyes of fire and the burnished brass feet. And pay attention because this is happening more and more in our services or in our churches in the country today. We're dealing with this more and more. You got to make sure it doesn't come to you. Our job is to be cleaner, not more compromised. We talked about this morning, the men's conference that had the male stripper. Well, he doesn't call himself, a, well, he was a male stripper formerly. But when you tear your shirt off at a men's conference and you're a dude with muscles and you do it with flamboyance, I watched the video. I mean, to tear your shirt off with flamboyance and flex your rippling muscles in front of 5,000 men and then do a pole dance and swallow a sword. Uh, I don't know why there's anybody left in that building. <laughs> Seriously, may it all just come tumbling down. <laughs> I mean, let do this for your wife, you know, let your shirt come off for your wife. I don't think anybody here is going to ripple with muscles like that. I mean, you've got ridges and ripples, but they're not the muscular kind. You might do this and see how long it stops jiggling. <laughs> When we start teaching God's people in conferences how to violate their conscience, God's done. God's not in that place. And we got to watch out for our, our families too. That we don't, go, we don't let our kids run with people that teach them to violate their conscience. We don't let them fellowship or hang out. And, and you college kids, make sure you don't run with people that start undermining your faith. You should make them uncomfortable. Don't let them make you uncomfortable. You should push them. Don't let them push you. You ought to control the friendship. If you're going to serve Jesus and if you can't in a sense control the friendship move away you, you can't be friends with them verse 21 I gave her time to repent there's the mercy that's all you get I gave her time to repent but she does not want to turn away from her immorality that means at some point God is done hear the word of the Lord in the revelation to a first century church newly established, less than 60 years old, maybe probably only 40 years old. God gave her a season. We have no idea how long that was. 
And then at this point, God says, but she doesn't want to repent, so I am done. There comes a point when God is done. There comes a point when God is done. God does not instruct the church to pray for her. God does not instruct the church to intercede for her. God does not instruct the church to go to her and correct her. God says, I am done, and this is my judgment. We fail to see the severity of things. I was, uh, actually, we were with Dr. Barclay a week ago, two weeks ago, and he was ministering on Judas in the morning, and and it's horrific. Judas walked with Jesus. Judas did signs and wonders. Judas kept the money bag. Judas betrayed Jesus, and Judas went to hell. And while we're in the service, it dawns on me, and Judas was probably 22 years old. How old do we think of Judas? 40? 50? History tells us they were all late teenagers, early 20-year-olds when the Lord picked them. That means Jesus condemned Judas to an eternity in hell, and he was 21, 22, 23, 24. He had three years with Jesus. He knew better. He earned hell. No compassion, no mercy, no salvation, no second chance, no mulligans, no do-overs. He knew better, and he went to hell. We forget the severity of our God. We're so busy trying to pack our buildings, get our numbers up, brag about salvations and water baptisms, we forget the severity of God. It's a high, it's a high place. It's a narrow path. It's a narrow gate. Few be they that enter therein. He said, I gave her time, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. He quits pursuing her. I gave her time. She doesn't want to repent. So hear me. With your prodigals, with your friends, you give them time to repent. They don't want to. Quit chasing them. Quit going after them. Quit throwing your money at them. You're going to hurt yourself because your tent's going to be next to theirs when judgment falls. She does not want to turn away from her immorality. Verse 22, therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering. That's our loving Jesus. Because that's what you do with wicked people in the church. That's in the epistles too. Jesus Christ, the lovey-dovey hippie dude, takes his enemies who mock him and pervert his church, and he throws them on a bed of suffering. When they refuse to repent, you can't fix it. I can't fix it. Jesus says, I'll fix it. And he afflicts them. And it's the judgment of God. And you can't help that situation. And if you try to sneak them medicine or show compassion on them, you're undermining what God is wanting to do. Only their heart crying out for mercy turns the situation. Only their heart crying out for mercy can turn the situation. But why do we have to be so stubborn that affliction and the Lord of glory throwing us on a bed of affliction is the only thing that can change our heart? We could have changed it any time we wanted to. So, so could the prodigal, but they didn't want to. Please hear me that when you've got prodigals or backslidden loved ones or friends or buddies or whatever, and you're trying to save them, you can't save them. When their heart is set, by being in their presence, you're putting peace on them that gives them energy to go further into damnation. Slipping them what Dr. Barclay calls burger money only gives them more energy to go further into a distant land, to go deeper into a pig pen. The judgment of God is many times the righteous people drawing away from the backslider and leaving them all alone in outer darkness so that they would wake up and say, all the righteous, holy people I know have moved so far from my life. And the devil will tell them all sorts of things, but they'll know the truth on the inside. And maybe the Lord will say, text them. You're going to hell. Repent. Text them and say, you know how to get back to church. Repent. At this point, the only word you have for them is repent. I will throw her on a bed of suffering. That just doesn't feel lovey-dovey. And those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. So all of her disciples will suffer as well. And this is the pastor's fault, by the way, because he permitted all this. Yeah, he did some great stuff, but he didn't deal with this because Jezebels are always real intimidating. Jezebels always seem to emasculate the leadership in their life, and the men aren't really sure what to do. And that's why we, we lean against it. We preach against it. We don't flippantly call anybody a Jezebel. But don't ever be anything like one so you don't have to ever hear the term be leveled at you. 
Just be holy, be sweet, be submissive, be a woman of prayer. We ought to be able to hear the holiness and the tenderness in your voice when you pray. We ought to be able to hear it in, in your worship. We ought to be able, able to hear the gentleness of a quiet and meek spirit when you lift your voice to worship God. Let me read this to you out of the NAS real quick. You don't have to turn there, and we don't have to do anything on the jumbotron with it. Uh, this version brings out something. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. See, they're only replicating what she has taught them. Dr. Barclay says it's always a who, always a who. It's always a who that perverts you. It's always a who that perverts you. It's always the people you run with. So you have to run with people better than you. And if you don't want to run with people better than you, you've got to ask why. Why, am I, why. why do I hang out with the riffraff and the dregs of society? Verse 23, I will strike your children dead. There's your lovey Jesus. I will strike her children dead. There's a hard way to interpret that. Nobody offers anything satisfactory. Is that her literal kids? Do they suffer because of Jezebel's rebellion? Could be. Is it spiritual offspring? Hey, could be. We talk about sons and daughters in the faith. That would fit as well. I don't, I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. I do know that you and I can sin and our children reap the ramifications of it. I know you and I can backslide and it costs our kids dearly. So that does apply. But at the same time, if these are her spiritual sons and daughters and they're living and they become twofold more of the child of hell than her, they can be killed too because of the sin. All of this is because of the next part. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and the intentions of every person or the King James says, I am he that searches the emotions in their hearts, the reins in the hearts. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. We keep saying this, the life you're currently living is what you deserve. Now, this is a hard verse because it means God has a meritocracy. You earned it. Your marriage, you earned it. Your finances, you earned it. Your joy, you earned it. Your success, you earned it. Your lack of success, you earned it. Two witnesses now, Jeremiah 17. Now, honestly, when Jesus says it himself, I don't know if we need to. If we just have Jesus saying it. <laughs> Red letters is just like, here's all the witness you need. Find it in other places if you want it explained better, but this is all you need. <laughs> when the Lord of glory himself says it, I am he that searches the hearts of every person and I give you what you deserve. Then that really takes away any complaining. And instead of complaining, we would do well to say, Father, forgive me. Father, have mercy on me. Father, help me. Lord, I have not done what you have trained me to do. Lord, I have not done what you've taught. Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, live forever. Please, Father, tell me again what I should do and help me obey you out of this hellhole I'm in. Help me obey you out of this mess that I've made. We can't complain because most of what we want to complain about is somehow our doing to some capacity. Sure beats the American culture, which is I got to pay reparations for somebody I didn't enslave. That's the shiftlessness of our nation. I owe you nothing but to love you. And if I've done no crime against you, I owe you nothing. This is how far our nation is from it, that even our politicians are like, oh, I think we should spend $100 million evaluating how much money we should give. Well, just tax me because I'm double taxed anyway, because I actually work for a living. Now, we ought to take responsibility for our lives. You and God is the majority, which means if your life stinks, you left God somewhere and you did it in your own strength. But we ought to have the increases of God working in our life. If he promises to give us according to our deeds, according to our works, after we searched our heart, then really our lives ought to be on the upward trajectory. If we're as spiritual as we think we are, if we're as holy as we think we are, if we're as right as we think we are. The promotion of God cannot keep us down. Even if you're the apostle apostle and you're in a jail, you're not in there long. And even from there, you're writing epistles and you're writing letters and you're steering the entire New Testament church and you actually have counsel with Nero himself and you're rebuking him right before he takes his, your head off. That's still promotion. So how are we still hovering in the past? Do we allow God to judge our heart? Do we allow God to evaluate us? You, you can change whatever's going on in your life if you will judge your thoughts, judge your emotions, judge your wants, 
and line them all with the word of God. It'll make you a stronger human being, make you a better believer. And you have to be mindful that just because you want it doesn't mean God's going to give it to you. You got to make sure your thoughts are his thoughts and you adopt them. Verse 24, I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. Deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan, actually. <laughs> wow. Depths of Satan. That's what Jezebel likes to teach. The depths of Satan. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. Now, that to me is also an insult. I'm not going to give you anything new. Just hang on to what I give you. You don't get to be promoted. I, I just really wish you'd master what I already gave you. This, again, not an encouraging word, but it is love. Not a promotional word, but it is love. This is where the church at Thyatira was at the time. The heart of it is, I search the hearts. I'm exposing the church. Yeah, you got some good things going on on the surface, but here's what's rotting you from the inside behind the scenes. He tells the rest of the church, almost as if they're complicit or somehow compromised, I'll put no other burden upon you. Just hang on to what you've already learned. That'll do, pig. It's all I can trust you with. Let me ask you, when's the last time God gave you something new? When's the last time he promoted you? When's the last time he entrusted you with more? When's the last time your business took a step up, your career took a step up, your discipleship of other people took a step up, your time in the Word showed you more things you'd never seen? When's the last time God gave you more? And if you can't remember, you might find yourself here. God is infinite and the kingdom is ever expanding. There's always room for more promotion in your life if you want it. Now, this region wants you to be kind of, you know, slack-jawed, hackneyed, lazy, treating each other like white trash yelling at each other, cussing each other, lazy, belligerent, full of excuses. You live like that, God's not going to give you anything else. You haven't even done the first things. But if you want to beat that, you can by changing what this region put in your mind, your will, and your emotions. You can change whatever culture you were brought up in. You can change whatever culture mama gave you. You can change whatever culture daddy gave you. You can be better if you want to be. Not many folks simply want to because it takes work. And the older you get, the harder it does become. We talked about in my discipleship this week, bearing the burden of discipleship in your youth, bearing the burden of his discipline in youth, because the older you get, the more resistant you are to change. And change is hard when you've resisted it your entire life. Change is easy when it's just par for course. What do I do? I just change. I just adapt. We just go and flow and do what God wants us to do. So let's find another verse. To, actually, I should finish, finish this. Except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come to verse 26 to all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, obey me to the very end. To them, I will give authority over all the nations. This doesn't sound like every Christian is going to get authority over the nations. It doesn't sound like even every believer at that church would obey Jesus to the end. Obedience is an opportunity to serve our God and obedience. When God asks he honestly doesn't ask. He commands. We like to church it up and say, well, God asked me to do this. Like he asked a favor of me. He needs no favors of us. So let's, maybe we change our lingo and say, God commanded me and I had no option but to obey because he's my God. When you say, God asked me to do this, it's almost like he's in your pocket because he asked of you and, oh, well, you were just so magnanimous to let your God get what he wanted from you. That's perverse. God commands. We're slaves. We obey. He's blessed. We're blessed. We don't go to hell. We all win. Pretty simple. Anytime he commands something of you or I, we have an opportunity to be promoted. Anytime he commands, anytime he requires, that's going to be a test. He doesn't always request things that are easy. They're usually hard because the easy things we've already gotten. And the easy things are in the past. All that lies ahead of us is the next harder thing. But when we pass the harder thing, it becomes an easy thing and God promotes us to the next hard thing. And our region teaches us to be allergic to difficulty and to embrace the simple, which is why this region's Christianity is pretty lame. You have to do the hard things. You have to be willing to walk away in the hard seasons. You have to be willing to lay down the most dear things. You have to be willing to kill dreams 
and ambitions. You have to be willing to sell things and move away from things. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to recognize the Bible is true and your life is not your own. And if he touches anything in your life, in your heart, in your home, it's his and he can do with it what he wants. And if it's go burn it in the backyard, then baby, you're burning it before the sun goes down. I don't know where we learned to debate except maybe mom and dad allowed us to debate them when we were four. Some of you allow your children to debate and negotiate. You should be slapped. Children are not negotiators. If they negotiate at four, they'll be talking you out of your salvation at 16. I'm reminded just, there's been so many times in my life my heart got set on something that was not God. And the more I forced the square peg into the round hole, the more miserable I became. And the more I had to convince myself and convince myself, it almost became a constant mind, um, like a fidget spinner. You know, all these little things that kids play with. It's a little fidgety doodad, Rubik's Cube in my generation, then fidget spinners and little click blocks or whatever. When, when you're not in the will of God, your mind is always having to touch this thing to convince yourself it's right. I have found that when it's God, I don't even have to think about it. It's just the next thing that happens. In my experiences, mission trips that I planned and financed that weren't the will of God, I was having to mentally spin that thing every day to keep it going. Mission trips that are God, I don't even think about until it's time to get on an airplane. It's, just, it's not a hard, fast scriptural rule. It's just an experiential rule. When I got consumed of Japanese sword fighting, I had to touch that thing a thousand times a day in my mind to convince myself it was good. And the more I touched it, the more miserable I got because God never gave me permission to, to play with it, to touch it, to be consumed of it. Going to the Philippines, I shared this the other night because one of the things the Lord was dealing with me about, maybe for our congregation right now, is contentment. Being content where you are, content single, content married. Are you married? Seek not to be loose. That's a verse for some of you. I don't want to be loose. I just want someone dead. Well, that violates one of those first 10 commandments too. So that's... <laughs> Somehow, in this church, in the mid-90s, if, if you were going to be important to God, you had to have a ministry calling. Not that that was our church alone, but we had a lot of TBN going on. We had a lot of Word of Faith revival going on. We were consuming books, and anything that was anything was a five-fold ministry gift. So I look back now 30 years ago, and it's like if you were going to be important in our circles, you had to fabricate a ministry calling. Because just loving Jesus and being faithful to the end wasn't important enough. And somehow our culture looked down its nose at, at the sheep. But without sheep, there's no reason to be a minister. And now we're really into TBN ideologies. So people began fabricating callings. And I fully convinced we did that in this church. And it was great deception. And I remember somehow or another picking up that I was called to be a full-time missionary to Sierra Leone. I don't know how you make that stuff up, but you do. Probably a familiar spirit helps spin it along the, over the way, like one of those little circles that you see kids play with, little wheels that they take their stick, and the familiar spirit bumps you in that direction. So at the age of 19, I fabricate this missionary calling to Sierra Leone, and even when Sierra Leone fell apart, I still maintained this full-time calling to missions. Never did anybody stop to tell me that's crazy. You might have a pastoral thing. I don't know why nobody stopped to encourage me in that direction. Maybe they didn't see it either. Or if they did, they sure didn't help me by saying, maybe you want to back off this missionary thing. Needless to say, we're a lot more blunt than that anymore because that wasted a lot of my life. Trying to be peaceful and sweet wasted a lot of my life. I don't really have time for that anymore. We're running out of time. So if I'm a little more blunt than you like, enjoy. You're welcome. You'll thank me later. So I remember, it's 2004, going into 2005. And so for nearly 10 years, my whole life aimed at getting on the mission field, aimed at getting on the mission field, aimed at getting on the mission field. I was almost consumed of it. I assumed when God called me to Lester Summerall School, I assumed that would be the launch pad to Asian missions. I assumed it. I was going to Asia. That was my vision. I don't know how in the world I was so flippant and weird and went from Sierra Leone to now all of a sudden I'm consumed of Asia. But some of you have done the same thing. You're consumed of this calling for two or three years and all of a sudden this is your new calling for two or three years. And it's almost like the middle school girl dating lots of callings again. I remember being invited 
uh, by Dr. Sheets to go serve in Metro Manila. And I was excited and she was excited. And we had a meeting and I said, well, I need to talk to my pastors about it. So I called Pastor Vaughn and I had to step into the conference room at the engineering firm I worked at to make the phone call. And he was there at the office. He took the call. I said, I've been invited to go and uh, do an internship for Dr. Sumrall's ministry in Metro Manila. They, they're offering this to me. It's a one-year commitment. And I said, what do you think? Now, knowing full well in my heart, my heart's set. Now, Pastor Vaughn's life was falling apart the last few years, but he still operated as a pastor, and he, he still had the Samson anointing. He could kill Philistines all day long, and he could help his people all day long. And the first thing he said was, well, you've just determined you're not going to be content until you're overseas. And that arrested me in my tracks because I had a good enough understanding that we're to be content no matter where we are, even if that means never being overseas. And so what I thought I could do over the next four or five months is make the thing fit by finding contentment if it never fit. So now in my mind and in my heart, I'm playing weird double Dutch games. I'm, I'm content, I'm content, I'm content. And yet my pastor was trying to tell me, you're marching in the wrong direction and it's never going to fit. And ultimately it did not fit. I was miserable. My whole life about fell apart. Thankfully I did not get on the airplane, lost a lot of money, lost a lot of face, saved my life though. But what happened was my heart got attached to something that was not God. And I ultimately, it cost more to lay it down at the very end than if I'd laid it down in January of 2005. We've got to be willing to lay anything down. If, if we have to fight to keep breathing life into it, it may just need to die. The things of God, they stay quickened on their own. The, 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 the gifts and callings are without repentance. The destiny of Christ is without repentance. You don't have to keep convincing yourself and everybody around you this is God. If you have to keep blowing on it, the ember just needs to die. Maybe you lit the thing illegally. The Japanese sword fighting, I was trying to force that. Getting over to Manila, I was trying to force that. Some of these mission trips I've done, I've tried to force it. I was just so determined to get there. And we've all got the same testimonies. There's things we've tried to force. And again, your life, here, here's how your life sorts out. It's either the reward of God or it's your grace or you're just backslidden. It's only like really a couple options. You're either in the grace of God, doing what you're graced to do, or this is your reward for being lazy. That's it. And if you'd lean more into God, you see what you were really called to do. And if it hasn't materialized by now, it probably is not going to. So maybe it wasn't God at all. Okay, you're quiet on that. You're going to get prepared for that next book called Jesus, the Dream Killer. It will not be a bestseller, but those that will grab a hold of it, they can actually fulfill their destiny in Christ. I believe America will be full of those Matthew 7 folks that say, but Lord, Lord, have we not? And he'll say, I didn't ask you to do any of that. But Lord, Lord, I became a TikTok influencer for you. That wasn't anywhere in my plans for you. Let's come back to Philippians 3 and we'll wrap up here. Talking about the heart. Jesus gives every one of us according to our works. He judges our heart, then gives us according to our works. If your works are not rewarding you, you need to evaluate the heart behind them. If your works are not rewarding you, you need to evaluate the heart behind them because Jesus is giving you the life you have based on, we might say, the combination of your heart and the works that it's producing. And it is not hard to be promoted in God. It's not hard to be promoted in life. It's not hard to prosper in this nation. If you cannot prosper in this nation, you are doing something really wrong. We have folks in this church right now they don't even have a college degree and they're being promoted. It actually, it makes me a little bit mad. They're making more money now, like with hardly a GED, than I did after 10 years of geology work. And I'm, I don't begrudge that. It's been a long time ago for me now, but I've told a couple of them, you know how long I had to work as a geologist before I saw this kind of money? Good for you, man. Just keep doing it. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And save, live beneath your means, and prosper. 
but you can't, if you can't prosper in our country, this is the richest nation ever. You've been taught prosperity. You've been taught budgeting. You've been taught uh, self-control. You can't prosper in this nation. What is wrong with you? I want you to ask yourself, what is wrong with me? You can't prosper in this country, in this culture. You, you can't make it. You can't flourish. You can't come up. Something's wrong with you because this culture, the immigrants are coming across the border and prosper here. And you can't? And you were born and raised here? And the Africans come over legally, thank you. And they take high positions and make great money and you were born here and you can't get a degree and make great money? Of course, their home culture is not the same as yours. Because your home culture is the problem, not my country. Your upbringing is your problem. How you were raised is your problem, not my country. The only systematic problem is how you were raised. The rest of us flourish just fine. And anybody who comes in here and grabs a hold of what we do in this nation, they flourish just fine too. And remember, the cricketers don't get into fist fights when they lose a game. They say, good job, mate. Nice one. Philippians 3. We read this regularly here. It's important. Verse 7, what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. What's the last thing you lost for Jesus? What's the last thing you had to lose to glorify him? Have you lost anything? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things... And do count them but dung that I might win Jesus. What's the last thing you had to lose to glorify him? What's the last Japanese sword fighting you had to give up? The last mission trip you had to give up? The last purchase you had to give up? The last hobby you had to forfeit? The last act of repentance you had to proffer because you were in sin? What's the last thing you gave up to glorify Jesus? We glorify him when we decrease. Our nation teaches us me, 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 me. The flavor of our culture is narcissism. It's all about me. Social media expedites that. It, ugh. We invented the selfie because it's all about self. I do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You can't know him or his power without losing things. So what's the last few things you lost? What's the last few things you let God touch? What's the last few things you put on the altar for him? What, what has he been able to burn? What have you put on his altar? What burned and made a sweet-smelling savor for him? Have you burned anything lately? I think there comes a time where there's not much left to burn. But in this region, in our nation, we ought to have a good bonfire every service. And the more our friends and family apostatize, we can burn some of those relationships too for the glory of God in hopes that they would return. What's the last thing you burned for him that you might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That verse 11 bugs me because it means the resurrection of the dead is still a present if. Just because Paul was born again didn't mean it was guaranteed. That's how I read that. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained. He's admitting, I don't have it yet. So this is why we have to endure to the end. Obey to the end. Obey to the end. Obey to the end. <clears throat> if you're having to constantly touch something with your mind, you probably need to let it go. Anybody know that experience that I'm talking about? Yes. You're always like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, everybody. You got a lot of hands going up. You're, you're, you're forcing it. You're you're blowing it. You're running that kite. It's a dead wind. And you just keep running and running and running and running. And the Lord's like, just keep running, chubby. This is good for you. But that kite's never getting off the ground because I'm not in it. <laughs> At some point, you're like, oh, this is horrible. Let's wait for a windier day. <laughs> yeah. Quit trying to force it. Just say, Lord, I submit. I need your peace. I'm exhausted. My mind's exhausted. My body's exhausted. My family's exhausted. My money's exhausted. Please, Lord, 
<laughs> Listen, when I backed out of the Philippines, oh God Almighty, what a glorious day that was. It was so wonderful. I was so miserable. Just get me off this airplane, get me on an airplane going home. I don't care what I got to do through security. Will, you can kiss me on the cheek. You can pat me down anywhere you want to because they just about did. Whatever I got to do, just get me out of this airport and get me home. I am so out of the will of God. I am miserable. And then that one trip I was taking to Kenya, I don't know how I missed God on it. It was just a learning experience. I got to, as far as JFK in New York, flying from JFK straight to Nairobi, first time kind of flight, 14 hour flight. And I was so miserable leading into that trip. Had forced that thing. I don't know how I missed it, but I did. And I, sometimes you're like, well, it's the devil. Cause we like to blame the devil like, cause we're Pentecostals. The Baptists don't even know he exists, but we do. <laughs> we blame him for everything that's usually our doing. So I said, it's the devil. It's the de this is the devil opposing me. I'll just, I'll get to Nashville. I, this sounds a little spooky, but a lot of the stuff that buffets me when I leave a certain region, it leaves me because it's bound here. This thing went with me all the way to the airport. I was like, okay, well, he's got a bigger dominion than I thought, but he can't get on that airplane with me. And sure enough, I had peace on the airplane. I thought, here we go. And then I land in, in uh, JFK I'm like, oh God. <laughs> Yea, though I make my bed in hell, yet are you with me. This is God. I am miserable. And I called the elders. I called Manda first. And I called the elders like, I'm miserable. I don't think I'm getting on this airplane. Please pray for me. And then I called Dr. Barclay. He said, never get on an airplane without peace. I said, well, I got none. He said, well, then I'd go home. I was so miserable, just absolutely miserable. I sat there at the gate and I told Manda, I said, I feel like if I force this any further, every bit of me is going to disintegrate. I've never felt anything like it. And it wasn't demonic. It's just out of the will of God. And I told man that I would saw my left leg off right now for some peace. That's how miserable I was. So I happily rebooked and came. I spent, all I did was flew to New York that day, sat in the airport for four hours and flew home. That's all I did that day. That was my Friday. And I was happy to get home and lose a lot of money. But when you have been miserable and finding peace again, hallelujah, peace is Moss Mahor. See? <laughs> much better, more gooder. Mas, mas, mejor. <laughs> Amen. Mucho mas, mejor. <laughs> if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Thankfully, God is merciful. He'll let us be miserable to get our attention. I thank God for his misery. I thank God for his misery because once you know his misery, you appreciate his peace. And once you know his peace, you start to feel when it wanes and you're like, oh, 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 oh I'm going back over here. Well, you were inviting you. Oh, there's nothing but misery over there. You, as a believer, there is a grace and a permission to experience the extremes of both. And I pray every one of you experience spiritual misery. I really do. I hope you experience the extreme miseries I have trying to serve God, but doing it wrong with a good heart. The Philippines were not in rebellion. Kenya was not in rebellion. The things I've done for God that were wrong were not in rebellion. They were with the best of intentions, but they were not God. And he let me just like cruise out. It's like sledding on ice. And all of a sudden the ice runs out and you just spark on asphalt. And you know the difference between sledding on ice and sparking on pavement. And you quickly come to a screeching halt and you think, bless God, I'm getting back on that ice and I'm staying on the ice. You have to have those experiences so you know when someone is going off the ice into the concrete and you tell them, listen, I love you, but I can't go any further with you. I, I honestly pray that you all experience extreme misery in your service of God so you know what it's like to be in his will. Because once you taste those flavors, you'll know, I have smelled that before. We're not doing that again. Years ago, last example, I've eaten deer meat for a half my life, going back to college. I must honestly say I enjoy killing deer more than I enjoy eating it. Unless it's wrapped in bacon, then I enjoy eating it. And the Creebles have always supplied a copious amount of deer for us. And one time I was out visiting Mark when he was still alive. And I would go out there in the mornings and we'd hang out. And he'd always, sometimes he'd cook breakfast for me. So one morning he said, you want some eggs and deer? I was like, yeah, why not have breakfast with deer? The deer was bad. And it, I don't know if he couldn't smell it. I could smell it. And I thought, let's just treat this like a missionary experience. He got the deer out. He sliced it. I could smell it. He sauteed it. I could smell it. It was bad. It didn't taste bad. 
but every bite bringing it to my mouth, I could smell it. And (laughs) you have to have that experience with every kind of food so that you can know this is not good deer. If I had had a bunch of deer before, I would have thought this is how deer smells. Same like anytime you eat an exotic food, you have to ask the local, is this good? Because this doesn't smell good. Oh, brother, that smells perfect. Really? Oh, we gave you the best. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> My kids are learning what bad cheese smells like. Daddy is, ooh, yeah, yeah, that's, we don't want that on anything. And my wife will say, I already put it on the pizza that's in the oven. I was like, well, you could feed that to the kids because I ain't eating that. And we did that just recently. She said, really? I said, really? I like, it's cooking, so we should be okay, right? I'm not throwing up tonight. They can throw up tonight. I'm not eating that pizza. <laughs> You have to know what bad cheese smells like. You have to know what bad meat smells like. You have to know what bad eggs smell like so you know what good smells like. And you need to know what misery in Christ feels like so you can appreciate being in the perfect will of God. And once you're in the perfect will of God, you're like, I've never eaten that, never smelling that, never touching that because it's bad, bad, bad. What about milk when it gets clumpy and lumpy? What about, Bobby, that time you cracked into that egg and there was a baby chicken in there? The gray egg. The egg exploded. It was rotten and, oh, yeah. I mean, really, every egg is an act of faith, isn't it? (laughs) You're like, big dollars, big dollars, no whammies. Oh, look, there's a baby chicken. Oh, that's messed up. (laughs) All right, have you been helped tonight? Started off rough, ended on a light note. Amen. All right, why don't we stand to our feet? (laughs) Every egg is an act of faith. Just keep that in mind when you have eggs in the morning. Father, we thank you for helping us tonight on the heart. You warn us regularly. Our heart needs constant maintenance. You know that our heart, a majority of our heart is to serve you, to glorify. It's why we're here on a Sunday night, but things creep in, motives creep in, emotions grow squirrely. Our mind gets to wandering and tiptoeing and weird. Father, help us to rein it all in. And help us to keep our heart right for you. Help us keep our heart right for you, oh God. Help us keep our heart right. And I do pray sincerely, Lord, that you let us experience your misery, that you show us in your mercy, that we might know what it's like to be outside your will so we can have that distinct knowledge of knowing when the light is on and when it's off, when it's hot, when it's cold, when it's ripe, when it's sour. You help us to know, Lord, through experience, when we're in the will of God and we're completely out of the will of God. Without these extreme experiences, Lord, we can't really rightly divide what's going on and you require us to be spiritually discerning. If anyone here has never experienced that extreme misery, if they're in it now, Lord, let them know they're in it. Let them crank up the misery so they can see their backslidden. If they're in the will of God, crank up that peace so they can know this is what the perfect will of God feels like and may we always endeavor to be there and stay there. Help us, Lord, to adjust our our sight. Help us to adjust our taste. Help us to adjust our culture to know what is acceptable. Help us, Lord, to adjust it so we know what is acceptable to you. We thank you for giving us disciples and tutors in the Lord. You give us the word. You give us leadership. You give us ministers, experiences, prayer. You let us walk with you. Thank you for helping this congregation glorify you and serve you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name. Let's pray something together. We'll go home. Father, in Jesus' name, name, I submit to you. you. Judge me, O Lord. Lord. Judge my heart. Judge my my mind, my my will, will. my emotions. emotions. Judge my infatuations, my my passions. Show me what's you. Show me what displeases you. Show me where I'm wrong. And show me what to change. I give you my heart. I give you my life. And I submit to you, Lord. Thank you for having mercy on me. Even in misery. I still trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, love on somebody. We'll be back.